On the 9th of October 1962, Sylvia Plath wrote to her mother, Aurelia, Everything is breaking. Even my beloved bees set upon me today when I numbly knocked aside their sugar feeder, and I am all over stings. When she took up beekeeping just a few months earlier, Plath had proudly reported to her mother on her progress, writing that she had not been stung at all, while her husband, Ted Hughes, had had to flee after getting bees in his hair and being stung on his head. A lot had changed in the short time since then. Plath and Hughes's marriage had effectively ended, and her future living in Devon was up in the air. On the same day that Plath wrote to Aurelia saying everything was breaking, she had finished the last of a series of poems now known as her bee sequence. In the sequence, Plath tells a story of renewal and rebirth, and while it may have seemed an inauspicious day to have been stung all over by her bees, Plath recognised in her poems the necessity of pain and sacrifice to effect such a rebirth, a recognition that there is no sweetness without stings. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Ear Read This, Edinburgh's most powerful book podcast. I'm Ash, your host, and today I'll be talking about the poem Stings by Sylvia Plath. Following on from our last episode on The Swarm, Stings is another poem in Plath's B sequence, five poems that were written in the space of six days in October 1962. Now, as we said last time, The Swarm is a slightly contentious inclusion in the sequence. Plath left it in parentheses in her ordering of the poems. Uh, by contrast, Stings is seen by many critics as the centrepiece of the sequence. I mean, if you include the swarm in the sequence, it literally is the centrepiece. It is the third of these five poems. And it marks the point at which the speaker uh, asserts herself. I am in control, she says, in the seventh stanza of Stings. I love this poem, and I think it's an easy poem to love. It's chock full of memorable images, textures, uh, it's quite disgusting. I think there's a strong element of, of body horror in this poem. Uh, body horror and mutation imagery that Plath really excels at and gets all the juice out of. Um, it also has an iconic status in the story of Plath's own myth-making. Like the earlier poem, Electra on Azealia Path, which I've also recently made a podcast on, Stings is a densely packed node of Plathian themes, preoccupations and imagery. Uh, for a good reason, it is from this poem that Heather Clark took the title for her biography of Plath, Red Comet. So today, as usual, I'll be going through the poem in full, offering some critical insights from various writers on Plath, as well as some of, some of my own personal reflections on Stings. It's a 12 stanza poem written in classic Plathian quintains, five line stanzas, and I'll go through these two or three at a time. In between those sections, I'll be joined by my special guest for today's episode, Patricia Grisafi. Trish is a freelance writer of media criticism, short stories and poetry, and her first collection of poems, Animal, is out next year. Trish's book, Breaking Down Plath, is a critical introduction to Plath's writing, uh, aimed at middle to high school, or grammar school if you're over here in the UK, age students. It provides close readings of an astute selection of Plath poems, and has attracted high praise from several familiar faces on the uh, Eerie This podcast, Peter K. Steinberg, Gail Crowther, and Emily Van Dyne among them. If you're looking for a concise handbook on Sylvia Plath, I highly recommend uh, Trish's book. After reading it, it instantly became one of the books I always consult when I'm making these podcasts. Um, and I particularly appreciate Trish's emphasis on Plath's transformation of autobiographical material to write these poems. Uh, a welcome counterpoint to the um, all too prevalent idea that her poems begin and end at autobiography, which when I was high school, grammar school age, um, that was very much how Plath was framed to me. An idea which I hope uh, this podcast and, and these podcasts in general can, can help to dispel. Uh, we'll talk more about Trish's book uh, on tomorrow's episode, which comes out on the audio platform, so make sure you're subscribed on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, for now, I will leave a link in the episode description box where you can find out more information about Trish's book and buy yourself a copy. Now, as I said, Stings is the third poem in the B sequence, and we haven't yet looked at the two before it, the B meeting and the arrival of the B box. So before we get into Stings itself, I asked Trish to give us a sense of the story so far. Um, so basically in the B sequence, right, there are four poems that Plath included in her version of Ariel. Um, the B meeting, the arrival of the B box, Stings and Wintering. So you talked about the swarm with Peter, 
that was included in um, Ted Hughes's version of Ariel, but it was left out of Plath's version. So I'm gonna kind of leave it out in our conversation, but I'm really excited to see what Peter had to say about it um, because it isn't really talked about that much. So um, basically the B poems were uh, mostly written between October 3rd and 9th in 1962, um, which is kind of crazy to think of like these really ambitious poems in a really short span of time. <laughs> um, and they were based on Platt's uh, real life experience of beekeeping um, at her home in Devon. The bee meeting were introduced to the speaker of the poem. Um, the speaker is a new beekeeper. I'm gonna be using my hands a lot. <laughs> It's, all right. it's just um, audio for, for those listening at home. There's, a, there's, there's gestures. The gestures are here. <laughs> um, so in the bee meeting, um, right, we have the speaker who's like a new beekeeper um, and she is meeting the other like more seasoned beekeepers in her village. Um, and there's like a sense of vulnerability um, on her part. She kind of doesn't know what's happening. She's learning. It seems like it's kind of um, like a secret society almost. There's a bit of um, intrigue, I think, going on there. And a lot of moments in the poem where she is kind of like rendered motionless or she steps back to observe. But she basically, um, like we're establishing the speaker's interest in beekeeping and also her association with and relationship to the queen bee in the hive. Um, the next poem, which is the arrival of the bee box, um, the speaker has gotten her own box. So now she's kind of taken a step more towards being a part of the beekeeping community. Um, she calls the box dangerous. And I think it kind of sets up what I'll talk about with stings like this contained space is kind of like a threatening space. Um, and they're, you know, in this poem, the bees are inhabiting the space. They're kind of angry. They're making a lot of noise that the speaker has trouble, um, you know, articulating, which like I kind of equate with language, right? This sort of noisy sound of the bees that we can't make sense of. Um, and it reminds me a lot of Plath's relationship with the German language. Um, and we can talk about her dad's relationship to be keeping also, which is very much a part of this. Um, so at, at the end of this poem, the beekeeper fantasizes about freeing the bees. And she says like their space is only temporary. Um, and then that brings us to stings. So in stings, the beekeeper has continued her growth um, as you know, someone who keeps bees. She doesn't need the coverings anymore, right? In the beginning poem, she's really like armored up. Um, here in the poem, you see that she's got bare wrists. She's not wearing her hat. So basically she um, feels more free with the bees and associates more with them. She's learned to be with the bees. She's decorated their hive, you know, um, the line. I think she paints some hearts on it perhaps in the poem. I have, I have the, you know, poem next to me, but. Something about it being enameled. Yeah, yeah, like uh, to make it look like pretty, like home-like. Um, and she writes more about the queen herself as kind of like a force of creation, um, but also a force that needs to be liberated from the hive. Um, so she describes the bee as kind of like an old woman with torn shawls um, and like kind of dried hair. So she's kind of like a feminine figure that is past her prime. Um, and maybe has lived a really difficult life. And uh, the phrase like uh, dense hair, um, robbed of its plush, the body of the bee. So in essence, this bee has been domesticated, but she's lost something also. Spirit of my dead father protect me, I arrogantly prayed. Plath wrote in her journals of beekeeping in Devon. Of course, she would be thinking of her father, Otto Plath, the bee expert, uh, but perhaps this journal entry also shows that she was already beginning to formulate an idea of, of chivalric imagery and motifs that we see throughout the bee sequence and in particular in stings. Introducing the sequence for the BBC, Plath described her recent interest in beekeeping saying, I was intrigued from the start by this ancient art of stealing sweetness and by the heraldic regalia, the bee hats, the screen visors, the cheesecloth breastplates and gauntlets. Uh, those gauntlets make an appearance in the uh, opening of Stings. The way Plath phrases stealing sweetness recalls a honey in Greek myth, nectar of the gods connected to and sometimes almost interchangeable with the immortality conferring ambrosia. 
The mortals who tried to steal honey from the infant Zeus were chased away by bees and stung. Bees were also known as birds of the muses and inspired poets by placing honey on their lips. So in this mythological system, matter passes between mortal and immortals along a cycle that is both digestive and reproductive, and also linked to poetic glory. As we see when we get to the, the honey machine of stings, Platt's conception of the hive, all three of those ideas are linked. Food production, reproduction, and uh, poetic production. Plath was drawn to such imagery of, of these kind of working processes of elemental toil resulting in a hard-won reward, sometimes taking place over years and years. Think of her use of grits of sand being worked into pearl, um, raw, unpromising material gathered and slowly, slowly transfigured over however many years. And the act of writing her bee sequence proves to be one such process. As Anne Stevenson puts it, Platt's practical beekeeping notes yielded poetic gold. Here is my honey machine, Plath writes in this poem. It'll work without thinking, opening in spring. As she often is, Plath here is uh, uncannily prophetic. After Plath left Devon, her bees were left in the care of Winifred Davies, a woman who not only served as midwife to Plath as she gave birth to her second child, Nicholas, um, but who taught the poet beekeeping, a neat parallel in Susan Van Dyne's words that Plath very much enjoyed. In the book Sylvia Plath in Devon, A Year's Turning, Elizabeth Sigmund recalls for Gail Crowther what happened next to Plath's bees. The terrible winter of 1962-63 set in, the big freeze, and Plath would die in the February. During the terrible snowstorms, the roof blew off Plath's hive in the Davies garden. But come spring, when Davies went to check on the bees, they were still alive because Plath had wrapped and packed them so preciously. Not only did Plath's hive open in the spring, as she predicted, the spring of 1963 also marked the first flights from her more figurative honey machine, her work. Stings, along with six other poems, had been accepted by the London magazine on January 25th, 1963, and they were published posthumously, as it turned out, that April. Um, if you'd like to hear a little bit more about that particular issue of the London magazine, I actually recently made a video about it, because in the very same issue, um, there is featured another recent subject for one of my podcasts, Bridget Brophy. So I'll, I'll leave a link to that video in the episode description box. But Stings is not only the synthesis and transfiguration of Plath's beekeeping notes from that summer of 1962, they are also her final variations on a lifelong theme. As we mentioned last time, Plath had been experimenting with bee poems from very early on in her poetic writing. She's always, like, Plath had written um, early poems about bee bees, at least. Um, the one, one, I think, of the beekeeper's daughter. Um, so bees have always kind of been symbolic for Plath's writing um, and connects her back to the idea of um, a father figure, right? So in Plath's life, her father Otto was a scholar of bees um, and he wrote a book called, I believe it's Bumblebees and Their Ways. So that was his, that was his book. So like, for the person Plath to kind of create a space for beekeeping in her life was definitely, I think, a, a way for her to access a part of her father that was missing, right? Um, but also when Plath was living in Devon, she kind of, I mean, it's really wild how much she accomplished there. She really did everything. I mean, she had a garden, right? She rode horses, she raised bees, she took care of this house, right? It kind of was part of this whole, like, bucolic fantasy of hers um, to be in nature and to be connected to nature and these bees um, that she loved, right? I mean, she, you know, when you read her journal entries and um, letters, she talks like very lovingly about her bees. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to see her as, you know, imagining herself fulfilling kind of like a familial um, role, right? My father was a bee uh, scholar and, you know, now I am a beekeeper. So that kind of, you know, um, maybe fantasy on her part. So here are the first three stanzas of Stings. Barehanded, I hand the combs. The man in white smiles, barehanded. Our cheesecloth gauntlets, neat and sweet. The throats of our wrists, brave lilies. He and I have a thousand clean cells between us. Eight combs of yellow cups. And the hive itself a teacup. 
white with pink flowers on it. With excessive love, I enameled it, thinking sweetness, sweetness. Brood cells grey as the fossils of shells terrify me, they seem so old. What am I buying, wormy mahogany? Is there any queen at all in it? So barehanded, I hand the combs. The man in white smiles barehanded. The poet is getting stuck in right from the start. Barehanded, um, she's calm. There is no immediate sense of danger, but perhaps there is a sense of, of lumbering clumsiness. Barehanded in conjunction with honey uh, inevitably makes the reader think of another kind of bear, not known for handling things with much delicacy. Um, but uh, famously keen on honey. Uh, the man in white smiles barehanded, so we have this repetition of barehanded, barehanded. Um, this kind of like joins the speaker and the man in white. Two, ra two ways to read the line, the man in white smiles. Um, it could be that the man in white is smiling, or it could be the man in clad in white smiles. The first indicates a sort of angelic smiling presence, the second clad in multiple smiles, indicating a degree of falsity, sounding more like a, a false friend. That he is dressed in white encourages the idea that he's some kind of angelic presence or an apparition, perhaps some kind of revenant. This is a poem that's much concerned with rebirth, uh, and there are those that have suggested that the, the man in white is some kind of resurrection of Plath's father muse figure either Otto, literally Otto himself, or the, um, the sea god Father Muse, the kind of composite figure that Plath talks about elsewhere. In her first beekeeping outings, uh, Plath records waiting for an expert called Jenna, who she describes as a dark, rather nice, unruly looking man wearing a white boiler suit. So there is a, a practical reason for him wearing white as well. Uh, and like I said, he's also described as barehanded. Or are they barehanded? In the next line, we find out they're wearing our cheesecloth gauntlets, neat and sweet. So they're not quite barehanded. Uh, but here we have another of Platt's many semi-transparencies or semi-transparent textures. Cheesecloth. If you were wearing a cheesecloth, a cheesecloth uh, gauntlet, you would very much be able to see your hand through it. And I think if you were wearing them handling bees, you would pretty much feel like you were barehanded. Um, the throats of our wrists, brave lilies, along with these knightly gauntlets, the brave lilies of their throats also help to give us a, a kind of chivalric ring. Um, and there's something sacrificial sounding about a bared throat, especially a brave one. It sounds like uh, the throat of, uh, of someone bravely resolved to their fate. The throats of our wrists, are, uh, there's, a, there's a real sense of there's a real sense of vulnerability to it. The wrists between the gauntlet and the sleeve is exposed, uh, like the exposed throat between a knight's armour and his helmet, perhaps. Karen Ford points out that the cheesecloth gauntlets continue an image of armour from the first poem in the sequence, The Bee Meeting. Breastplates of cheesecloth knotted under the armpits. Similarly, writes Ford, that poem's ghastly image of feeling nude as a chicken neck finds its more delicate counterpart here in the throats of our wrists being brave lilies. Another thing to consider, perhaps, is that given, given that bees communicate by touch, the wrist being the throat might imply that the bare hands are effectively the poet's mouth. Instead of using them to write poems, she is using them to interact with bees. Gathering material for the collected writings of Asia Wevel, editors Peter K. Steinberg and Julie Goodspeed Chadwick found the line, The Throats of Our Wrists Brave Lilies, inscribed by Asia Wevel in her papers, under which she had written, So this is what it's like. Time stretches on and on and on. It's like being four again by myself, tired, not to bed, but tired, caged, slightly upstairs. Rather ambiguously phrased that, but Wevel appears to be picking up on a on a theme of stings, which is kept women, women forced into a kind of drudgery that is that is suffocating them. It's leaving them in a sort of half asleep kind of state. He and I is the line that ends this stanza. The isolation of he and I indicating some kind of significance to the relationship or the, to the pairing. Have a thousand clean cells between us, eight combs of yellow cups. So between the two beekeepers lie the currently unoccupied cells of the eight combs. Uh, there are various theories on the significance of the number eight, which recurs later in the poem, suggesting that there is some kind of significance. Uh, it could just be for scansion and rhyme. In her handwritten draft, uh, Plath has comb after comb crossed out and replaced with eight. But others have suggested that it implies a connection to Otto Plath, 
Otto is Italian for eight, and the bees that Plath was working with incidentally were Italian hybrids. In her journal, she describes the beautiful red-gold Italian queen. Uh, Otto also died when Plath was eight years old, which she refers to um, several times in her work. Then there is the so-called waggle dance of bees, a distinctive figure of eight flight pattern which supposedly communicates to fellow bees the position of food resources. So it could be a particular bee connection. Uh, but frequently in her journals, Plath seems to notice or pick up on incidences of eight. Uh, for instance, if she writes eight poems in eight days, or realising that she is eight years off being 35, a sum of eight. Uh, she makes a point in the journal entry which details her, her beekeeping, her searching for the queen, of noting that it grew later, 8, 8.30, she makes a point of saying. The thousand clean cells between the two figures, well, bees uh, reuse and clean the cells of their comb. So the poet might be saying, although they're clean, the comb that lies uh, physically between us betokens some kind of history. So there's a lot of baggage and there's a lot of fresh starts between us. Uh, those who are keen on the idea of the man in white being some kind of instance or figuration of Otoplath have wondered if the thousand cells indicates genetic material, literally cells in common. Uh, either way, combined with the he and I in significant separation, we're very much getting the impression here that these two either know each other well or, because of what they're doing, will know each other well. And the hive itself, a teacup, white with pink flowers on it, with excessive love, I enameled it. So she has decorated the hive with excessive love, the hive that she apparently shares with this man in white, or man in white smiles, depending on how you're reading it. Uh, Plath did paint the hive that she got with Hughes. I think she says she paint, paints it white and green. The design here sounds very similar to the way Plath painted her children's nursery chair and cradle, white with red flowers and hearts. The hive itself being a teacup also encourages a strong domestic association with the hive, which uh, will return throughout the poem. As Janine Dobbs has written, for Plath, domesticity is an ultimate concern. A possible hint of self-reproach in that excessive love. Did she try too hard? Did she give the, the hive more of herself than she should? Um, enamel gives us another glossy, semi-transparent material. It has a metallic finish and it is made from powdered glass. With excessive love, I enameled it, thinking sweetness, sweetness. It's almost like she's willing sweetness. I'm reminded of the prayer in Plath's journal, um, Spirit of my dead father, protect me. She's enameled the hive, thinking sweetness, sweetness, wishing uh, and willing her honey machine to succeed and bring forth sweetness. Uh, sweetness, sweetness caps off the repetitive, sickly sweet E sounds we hear throughout this section. Cheesecloth, neat and sweet, clean between us, teacup, sweetness, seam, queen, he and I. This is excessive love indeed, a cloyingly sweet number of E's. They kind of fill your mouth like treacle when you read them. Karen Ford has written that Stings is so renowned for its ferocity that it is easy to forget this painfully tender opening. And Ford goes on to offer an explanation for this, saying that the earliest drafts of the poem were written on the reverse side of several of Hughes's poems about the birth of their first child. These were pages that documented their lost happiness. Thus, she began the poem in a period of acute pain and on the very papers that could only serve to intensify her misery. As in life, so it is with bees, there is no sweetness without stings. In another sweetness-stealing honey, to go with that one I mentioned earlier about the infant Zeus, Cupid took honey from a hive and was stung as a result. When he complained to Venus, he was told that the bees were only protecting their treasure. They were stinging out of love, just as Cupid himself is a small winged creature firing off arrows, which are stings of love. Stings and sweetness are more than usually linked for Plath. The sting of bees took away my father, she wrote in an earlier poem. But as Anne Stevenson has written, the very sickness that killed Otto Plath, diabetes, was linked to the cloying sweetness of honey. So Karen Ford calls this section uh, painfully tender, but I, but I think it could also be seen as excessive love itself, excessive sweetness. Like the slightly campy prayer in her journals, Spirit of my dead father protect me, exclamation mark. Plath can be solemn and glib about the same thing, and in the same place sometimes. And I think there is something cloying about all this 
whiteness and it's all a little bit neat and sweet. I think she's, she's emphasizing a kind of over-the-top purity to the scene. Brood cells, grey as the fossils of shells, terrify me, they seem so old. What am I buying, wormy mahogany? Is there any queen at all in it? So looked at one way, a cynical way perhaps, the poet is buying just a bug-riddled block of wood. Uh, not even a fresh comb, maybe, one that has housed untold generations of bees. These brood cells are to serve as cradles for future bees, but they are grey as the fossils of shells, a rather grim disparity, which is uh, terrifying. Jessica Lewis Luck picks up on the macabre side of this, writing that in Stings, Plath seems to parody a scientific empirical search for centres and origins. The hive itself is laid out like a cadaver on the table, as the two beekeepers perform an autopsy on the brain-like grey matter and wormy mahogany of brood cells grey as the fossils of shells. I think that's great and ironic given that in the 60 years since Plath wrote this poem, uh, a forensic attention similar to that which the poet applies to the hive has been applied to the poem by critics. As Mary Lynn Bro writes, since 1963, a remarkable range of poems has been autopsied, reduced to snippets of coroner's reports, and then reassembled every few years in some new literary exhuming. No, it's interesting. And like, you know, I'm not a, I don't have a knowledge of bees, you know, by any means. So I had to read, you know, writing this, you have to read a little bit about what bees, you know, behaviors of bees and things like that. So, you know, um, there's a part where the bees go and, um, sting the third person right and you know when the bee stings they die right so those bees decided it was worth it to die to harm this third person but the queen did not mm. right the queen didn't want to waste <laughs> she didn't want to waste her life right spending it to harm this person so that's kind of one way to look at it and um the kind of uh creativity that I think Plath sees in the bee that she really wants to let go, right? She wants to free this bee, you know, do you contain, it's, if you think about it, it's like containing the power, releasing the power, what does it mean to keep the bee and versus letting her free? And it reminds me a lot of the poem, Ariel, where you see in that poem, the speaker imagining her horseback riding experience as kind of ending in a very similar way where do we free this kind of spirit or do we contain it and it's freed right that I think Plath is always going to want to free this the spirit so to speak and that's like the creative spirit that's her ability to write um so when 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 she says like you know she's flying right um the bee is flying and in Ariel she is flying also into the red eye you know the cauldron of morning it's kind of like the same choice is being made and that's and that's a powerful choice because it's it's scary but it's also freeing right the liberation of the bee i think is the liberation of this sort of like um voice that has been suppressed for a while in the domestic space so here are the next three stanzas of stings if there is she is old her wings torn shawls her long body rubbed of its plush poor and bare and unqueenly and even shameful I stand in a column of winged, unmiraculous women, honey drudges. I am no drudge, though for years I have eaten dust and dried plates with my dense hair, and seen my strangeness evaporate, blue dew from dangerous skin. Will they hate me, these women who only scurry, whose news is the open cherry, the open clover? So if there is, she is old, her wings torn shawls, her long body rubbed of its plush. So if there is a queen, she is well past her best. She is worn down, she has fallen on hard times, she is reaching the end of her reign. A new young queen will soon take her place. Now this does seem to invite an autobiographical reading. We don't have to try too much to, to, to see it. Plath is getting a divorce catalyzed by her husband's uh, relationship with a new lover. Now, we will see shortly that the poet has connected her selfhood with the queen. I have a self to recover, a queen, she says. Uh, Tony Saldivar has responded to this, um, suggesting that contrary to the widely held interpretation that the poet means to rediscover her true queenly status, that instead we are meant to read recover, as in reupholster, a new fabric or fabrication as a new theory of self in Saldivar's words. And funnily enough, a, a curious detail in Plath's journal supports this. 
On the 8th of June, the day Plath went to collect her new hive, they were met by Charlie Pollard, who sort of got them started with the beekeeping. And uh, he told Plath and Hughes that following the river tour, breaking its banks and flooding, he had to have his rugs cleaned and his upholstered sofa and chairs all redone at the bottom. A totally incidental bit of, of, of gossip that um, seemingly was swept up when Plath returned to these journals to start synthesizing material for her poems. Rubbed of its plush certainly does also sound like a, a balding sofa, balding fabric, something that needs reupholstering. Um, I really like that idea of being reupholstered. It does sound a bit loopy at first, but it, I think it fits, and I think it supports what uh, Judith Kroll has written, which is that it is the queen ship that Plath identifies with, not the queen herself. In Stings, writes Kroll, it is the queen ship that is immortal rather than the individual queen bee. In this way, Plath uses the idea of queen ship and its ongoing immortality to express that the true self can always be recovered, however dormant or dead, while the false self, the apparent vehicle of the true self, can really be permanently killed or altered. Plath would have known that there was nothing much to envy about the life of an individual queen. Mary Lynn Bro has written that the queen suffers a kind of death in life. Her world, as Bro says, is one moment of terribly limited splendour, circumscribed by sacrifice. She has given up daylight, a voice in such major hive decisions as swarming, freedom of flight, the calyx of flowers, even some power in the matter of her own life and death, all for her worshipped prison of procreation. Her status is deceptive, for the real mind power and occupational unity of the hive reside in the liaison of thousands of short-lived workers, cowering under their disguise of mediocrity. So when we hear her wings likened to torn shawls, this is presumably from lack of use. She, she never flies the queen, she lies within the hive and just endlessly produces eggs. She's rubbed of her plush by being constantly cramped by her swarming subjects. And if you have the impression that in this matriarchal system the queen has her pick of, of male lovers, a kind of endless harem of, of male bees to reproduce with, you'd be wrong. Instead, the queens, uh, queen bees mate for only a week or so early in their lives and then store the sperm from those encounters during the mating flights for the rest of her life. That could be multiple male partners, it could just be one. Holly Ranger has written... Uh, really interestingly about Platt's use of the classics and suggests that this image of, of torn shawls being rubbed of, its, rubbed of its plush may come from Virgil's fourth Georgic, which we mentioned briefly on the last episode. There, Virgil has a similar line, often they even wear down their wings as they bumble against the hard rocks and freely give their lives under the load. Ranger mentions this in conjunction with the reference to the furious Latin of the bees in the previous poem, Arrival of the Bee Box, suggesting that the bee poems as a whole provide an implicit criticism of uh, the Greek classical world with its male heroes supported by silent women. Rubbed of its plush, poor and bare and unqueenly and even shameful. So no finery for this queen, she is trapped in darkness, her life an endless repetition of egg-laying, something quite sort of alien and, and, and grotesque about that. Um, fathered, uh, th these eggs that she is laying, when they're fertilised, they are fathered by a long dead bee. For the, uh, for the male consort, the act of mating is lethal. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more later on. So no new partners for the queen and the father of her children long dead. She is now reduced to being basically an egg machine. Now you might be picking up on a slightly fairy tale sound. Well, we've already mentioned chivalry, but there's a bit of a fairy tale sound to all of this. Uh, there's a much more overt Cinderella reference on the way, but here we have a queen in shawls doing work that is even shameful, so kind of lowly work for one of her station. The opening of the poem has a kind of fairy tale ring to it too, two innocents in their nightly regalia seeking out a queen. And a return of the word uh, bear here, poor and bear and unqueenly, um, the word bear linking the queen to the speaker with her bare hands. I stand in a column of winged, unmiraculous women, honey drudges. Great image this. You Think of the queen bee surrounded by her workers in the hive. The overwhelming majority of a, of a bee colony is female, so the queen really does live in a, a column of women. 
Um, but you also think of a beekeeper, perhaps, in the centre of a swarm. It reminds me of, of the Plath poem Two Lovers in a Beachcomber by the Real Sea, where a figure is wrapped in a tent of taunting gulls. Um, or Lament, where the poet imagines her father walking in a swarming shroud of wings. But thinking of this line in terms of the immortal queenship idea we, we talked about before, we might see the column as a kind of bee line, a royal line, uh, a long history of women who have been robbed of their strangeness, cast into drudgery. Winged, unmiraculous women is, as many critics point out, an oxymoron. Winged women are, in fact, miraculous. That sounds rather like angels. Uh, these, however, are honey drudges. I am no drudge, though for years I have eaten dust and dried plates with my dense hair. I'm reminded here of Plath expressing her frustration at her domestic boredom, describing it in a, a letter to her mother as this cow life. A cow that births and produces and is kept and eventually sacrificed in most cases isn't all that dissimilar from the not-so-regal life of a queen bee. In bleak contrast to that golden food cycle of honey linked to reproduction and the muses, the arts, uh, Plath's speaker eats dust and dries pla plates with her hair. Both of these details evoke biblical imagery, Satan's followers being uh, turned into serpents, the fruit they eat turning into ashes in their mouths, as featured in Book 10 of Paradise Lost. Or the speaker of Psalm 102, whose days vanish like smoke and eats ashes like bread. Uh, Platt's speaker is no drudge, but she is living a life of drudgery. Food has all the relish of dust. And we see this kind of automatic, joyless eating elsewhere in Plath, very memorably in the bell jar. A similar numb feeling uh, exists in The Jailer, too, a poem I've spoke, to, spoke about on the podcast before. My night sweats grease his breakfast plate. A similar image evoking a, a, a horrible cyclic existence, which has had all the flavour bleached out of it. Judith Kroll le links the drying plates with hair to Mary Magdalene, who wash washed Jesus' feet with tears and then dried them with her hair. Drudgery, repentance and submission are Mary Magdalene's salvation, as Kroll says, but for the speaker of stings, it is death in life. There's that phrase again, crops up a lot with Plath. And seen my strangeness evaporate, blue dew from dangerous skin. Wonderful line, again, a very magical feeling to it. Blue dew from dangerous skin, I'm thinking of like a, a blue fairy, perhaps robbed of their powers, made mortal. Uh, strangeness, sort of what, what, this, what makes the speaker individual, her special power, her strangeness, her individuality. Blue dew from dangerous skin, thinking about this autobiographically, Plath's strangeness, her powers, what made her an individual was her writing, her poetry. And one consequence of the cow life that she resented was having much less time for writing. So she has seen her writing dry up. Quite literally, the ink like blue dew has evaporated from the dangerous skin of the page. As Susan Van Dyne says, what the speaker requires is uninhibited self-expression. The recovered self longs to leave her mark elsewhere than in the faces of her children. The queen's more terrible need is to reinscribe her identity on the heavens. Will they hate me, these women who only scurry, whose news is the open cherry, the open clover? So if she leaves this life of drudgery or speaks out against it, will that turn the other women, her fellow women, against her? Scurry, this makes the, uh, the, a word that makes the women sound trivial, perhaps, maybe even bordering on verminous. Scurry like a, like a rat, like a beetle, cockroach, a bee. I'm thinking again of all those bees swarming over their queen. Uh, Judith Kroll describes the line, open cherry, open clover, as the bee equivalent of sexual gossip. The speaker wants to leave such trivialities behind, but suspects that it, uh, doing so will isolate her. Now, in the next section, we're going to be introduced to a third person who is watching the speaker and the bee seller. To set that section up, I asked Trish who she thinks the third person is. The third person in the poem, like, I'm not exactly sure who the person is meant to be. Like, it's really tempting to be like, oh, it's it's a husband or a male figure who's watching because like the poet or the speaker says he was sweet, but the kind of <laughs> the bees like set upon him, you know, like, so it's kind of a little like act of revenge, um, like the bees discover him and attack him and like swarm his face and bite him, which is kind of a, I mean, it reminds me of the scene in Candyman, right? With the, <laughs> 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 the bees are like, 
you know, like rendering the face um, that you can't see the person underneath it. It's just like bees. Um, mm. <laughs> but it's it's interesting, like the way that I think the speaker oh. sees the bee, the bees is like her own personal, like um, workers in a sense, like they're doing her bidding. Yeah, sting that man. <laughs> we don't yeah, like exactly. Him. Yeah, <laughs> show, show him for what he is. Right, right. So here are stanzas seven and eight of Stings. It is almost over. I am in control. Here is my honey machine. It will work without thinking. Opening in spring like an industrious virgin to scour the creaming crests as the moon for its ivory powders scours the sea. A third person is watching. He has nothing to do with the bee seller or me. I'm going to leave off the last line of stanza eight for now because it sets up a new uh, new sentence, a new idea. So it is almost over, rhyming with the open clover of the last stanza. So before the mention of her honey machine, we have this sort of chugging up to a rhyme, almost like a machine revving. Scurry, cherry, and then clover over. I am in control. Here is my honey machine. It will work without thinking. Opening in spring like an industrious virgin. The speaker asserts herself. This is no wormy mahogany after all. It is her machine. She owns it. It will bring her sweetness. It will work for her without thinking. As I mentioned earlier, I think this describes both an actual hive and Plath's work, her stored honey, her, her writing. She is in control now as the author, but she will let go. She will finish the work. She will release it into the world where it will travel to other minds, minds of readers, um, without her thinking about it. An industrious virgin, it will be a new creation, but it will bear the, uh, the industry, the effort of the work and love that she has put into it. Other interpretations of the hive, the honey machine that I've read include um, kind of a woman's body, a sexual or reproductive reading of the phrase honey machine, highlighting the speaker's physical regrowth and perhaps um, opening up to new potential partners, a new future. Others like Andrew Brink have read the hive as a mental illness taking an intractable form, uh, which does complement the black intractable mind of the swarm we talked about last time that kind of plural identity that plath talks about often multiple selves overlapping selves mary lynn bro writes quoting plath's earlier poem a life what is stunning is the way in which plath remains throughout her poetry a woman with too many dimensions to enter and i think we see this very clearly in stings the speaker is the beekeeper but she is also a drudge a drone toiling within the hive and she is also the queen of the hive, and perhaps also another kind of queen, a more fairy tale queen, a more kind of idealistic uh, queen. All of these reflect different aspects of the speaker, different selves. In that sense, the hive is a perfect metaphor for Plath. It contains a thousand selves, a thousand potentialities. And it's this overlaying of identities which makes me completely agree with what Trish has just said about the identity of the third person. I'm not inclined to believe it is simply Ted Hughes. Um, much as the same as I, I don't think the man in white is simply Otto Plath, or for that matter, uh, Jenna, the bee expert. Certainly Hughes and Otto Plath figure in this poem um, and leave their mark on this poem or, or, or are used in this poem for imagery. But just as the speaker has multiple overlaid selves, I think the other roles also blur and, um, and kind of cross-pollinate to, uh, to both intend and encourage a pun. Opening in spring like an industrious virgin to scour the creaming crests as the moon for its ivory powders scours the sea. Another beautiful phrase, um, that internal rhyme, ivory powders scours the sea. Uh, scour the creaming crests. So scour continues the Cinderella imagery, uh, an industrious virgin scouring, so cleaning, um, doing, doing drudge work. But also creaming crests, flowers scoured by bees for pollen. The moon for its ivory powders scouring the sea. That's that's a little um, less direct. Moon obviously controlling the tides. The ivory powders make, makes me think of the glow around the moon, almost like sitting like makeup, like a dust around the moon's face. Uh, a kind of mirror to the matriarchal kingdom of bees. Another kind of mystical feminine ritual hinted at here um, through the cultural link between lunar and menstrual cycles. A third person is watching. He has nothing to do with the bee seller or me. The fact that the speaker has an audience, however 
voyeuristic an audience uh, as this sounds indicates that what they're doing is a performance, a kind of ritual. He has nothing to do with the bee seller or me, but as we will see in the next section, he plays an important part in the speaker's eventual rebirth. So yeah, like Plath is obsessed with rebirth. Um, so many of her poems kind of figure rebirth into them. I think there's one difference. Other scholars obviously, you know, have talked about these poems too, right? This, you know, and they talk about the B poems as kind of more of a um, like celebration or something that is more optimistic than a lot of Platt's poems. And that's kind of, I think, why there was a big, um, I don't call it a scandal, but, you know, like a literary scandal about, you know, when we discovered the original um, draft of Ariel and we mm -hmm. saw just how Hughes had re- um, kind of configured the order of the poems, you know, and a lot of people have said to promote this like really dramatic um, kind of reading of that book that ends on, you know, very depressing, uh, a depressing note, instead of how Plath arranged the book, which was to end on wintering on a very positive note. So with Rebirth, um, you know, other poems I think about specifically uh, Lady Lazarus, right? There's, there's rebirths galore in that poem and also Ariel. But that, the rebirth in those poems, I feel like comes at such a great cost um, and is also very much related to death or dying or like the performance of dying. In these B poems, I feel like the rebirth is much more free. It's much more freeing and there doesn't, it doesn't kind of require a cost on the part of the speaker. Like she just has to go. Um, she just has to leave what is a toxic situation and and fly. Um, whereas in these other poems that deal with rebirth, the speaker has to go through so much trauma and I mean, like self annihilation, you know, in a sense to get to something that's going to that's going to maybe like make her feel whole again or make her fear feel new again, like start her life over. I mean, there's a lot at stake with, with freeing the queen, obviously, but, um, you know, the speaker doesn't have to maybe undergo this kind of like bodily mortification or these like degrading performances or these um, kind of really deeply, uh, like I said, like annihilating kind of motions to get to, to get to a new self, right? Yeah. So it's like the violence is deflected onto, onto someone else. Yeah. Yeah. So here are stanzas nine and 10 with that last line of stanza eight that I missed off. Now he is gone. In eight great bounds, a great scapegoat. Here is his slipper, here is another. And here is the square of white linen he wore instead of a hat. He was sweet, the sweat of his efforts, a rain tugging the world to fruit. The bees found him out, molding onto his lips like lies, complicating his features. So now he is gone, in eight great bounds, a great scapegoat. No sooner is the third person introduced than he is gone. Eight again, eight great bounds, a great scapegoat. Susan Van Dyne comments on, on Platt's liking for certain numbers, saying that the drafts of Stings frequently specify significant numbers reminiscent of fairy tales. There are eight combs of honey, the monstrous male figure vanishes in eight great bounds. The speaker's dense hair has been wasted in domestic drudgery for six years, the actual length of her marriage, although the more magical number seven also exists as an alternate, alternative choice in the same draft. As we've already heard, in the final draft, Platt simply goes for years and doesn't pick a number for that bit. So the third man is stung and flees. It sort of seems like a symbolic killing, a, a necessary sacrifice. Scapegoat refers to the goat that was not sacrificed but took the blame for people's sins. Similarly, our scapegoat takes the punishment. It's him that stung. Here is his slipper, here is another, and here is the square of white linen he wore instead of a hat. So there is a role reversal now. The Cinderella-like drudgery is no longer to be performed by the speaker. Instead, it is the male watcher who is compared to Cinderella, leaving behind his slipper as he flees. The square of white linen worn instead of a hat seems to have been inspired by Plath's beekeeping experiences with Ted Hughes in, uh, in June, that uh, time when he was stung on the head that I mentioned in the uh, introduction to the podcast. Uh, Hughes had worn a handkerchief on his head instead of a proper hat, and sure enough, the bees crawled into his hair and stung him. 
Plath wrote to her mother, he flew off with half a dozen stings, and I didn't get stung at all. Um, a square of white linen over the head also sounds quite deathly, like a sheet over the face of someone who has died. Uh, the face of Lazarus, for example, was wrapped in a handkerchief. He was sweet, the sweat of his efforts a rain, tugging the world to fruit. He was sweet is perfectly understated. It sounds like what someone might say of a satisfactory fling that has run, run its course. He was sweet. Uh, perhaps it was his sweetness that attracted the bees. Sweet um, transforms in the next line to sweat. The sweat of his efforts a rain, tugging the world to fruit. So in contrast to the moon scouring the sea for its ivory powders or the honey machine of the hive, this man's work sounds like hard, aggressive, physical, uh, unmagical sounding toil. It sounds like he has forced himself on the world, a bit like in antiquity, following the golden age, the turn to agriculture, forcing the earth to, uh, to work, to produce. Perhaps in that tugging, we even have a sense of, of pulling up fruit before its time. The bees found him out, moulding onto his lips like lies, complicating his features. Finally, we have stings described, and described in such a wonderfully indirect way. Uh, the bees don't find him, they find him out. And the next line's reference to lies makes it sound like they have found out his deceit, but she, she doesn't quite say that, um, just as she doesn't quite say they actually sting him. They mould onto his lips, they complicate his features. Isn't that brilliant, that bit? At the same time, we think of stings swelling up someone's face, complicating their features in that sort of um, graphic body horror sort of way. Uh, but also the way that lies don't sit right on a face, the way someone looks off or edgy or ill at ease, um, perhaps a sort of traditional idea of morality being writing itself on the face. Now, if we see the figure as Hughes, there is a particular justice in this. Obviously, Hughes had lied to Plath. He'd had his affair with Asia Wevel. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, bees, also known as the birds of the muses, were said to lay honey on the lips of poets and inspire them. Hesiod wrote that whomsoever they honoured and looked upon at his birth, on his tongue they shed a honeyed dew, and from his lips would drop gentle words, and he would speak counsel unerringly. But while the bees in this poem have an affinity with Plath, Plath or Plath's speaker, instead of laying honey on the uh, third person, perhaps Hughes's lips, they sting his face, they complicate his features. The third person has failed in the eyes of the muses. So if it is Hughes as a poet, this is sort of the ultimate rejection um, from, the, uh, from the muse, from the poetic gods. Susan Van Dyne notes that in earlier versions of Stings, Plath featured a lot more of this third person. It was much more vengeful in tone as well. Uh, unusually, amongst the B sequence, which was written at astonishing speed, Stings shows the most dramatic signs of revision, Van Dyne says. Plath had written and abandoned a totally different version of Stings in August, which focused solely on this stung scapegoat figure. In the second version, which is the one we're reading today, Plath includes the scapegoat, but pays much more attention to the recovery of the queen. We, we mentioned the the third person being stung and it and it, it being a little bit like, the, there is this sense of it being a just punishment. There is, there is a sense of like, somehow this, whatever this person is, uh, they, they kind of deserved it. What, in your opinion, do the bees sort of find out about the third person because she says that, that you know that they they found you him out and uh you know is it is it only hapless beekeeping or is there something else to it <laughs> i mean it's you know it's uh it's interesting because i think you know if we're doing and it's always so hard and you know when i talk about separating the life from the work it, there's only so much you can do i like to i like to think of the life as informing our interpretation of the work instead of like crowding it um or overwhelming it you know so you know this person it, it's a weird way to think about it. this person was not the third person was not worthy of the bee's love or not worthy of the bee's loyalty the bee set upon him you know as a punishment and uh it's a little magical I think on the part of the speaker um you know, thinking that there is some kind of a kinship between her and the bees where they're all working together, kind of, you know. Yeah, because there's that, there's that wonderful bit about the, that, that kind of vi vision of a natural ritual of, of the bees and it's compared to the, the, the moon's effect on the sea. And, the, and then by contrast, this third person is 
is it something like the, his sweat is tugging the fruit or uh, of the earth or something something like that it, it, it's like it, it's an image of some some kind of natural matriarchal ritual compared to some sort of blunt and inaccurate and potentially uh i don't know violent yes it's well it's the matriarchy right like so the matriarchy bees are matriarchy and like the bees are fed up with this guy right and i mean you get it in the next poem wintering there's that really fun line that i love um they have got rid of the men <laughs> <laughs> so like these bees are kind of you know they're at the service of female energy they don't want this third person this man kind of intruding and they cover his face again like with this uh i'll read it um poem here they mold onto his lips like lies. You know, that's a really, you know, they're almost preventing him from speaking. They're taking his voice away. They're letting the speaker have her own voice by ostensibly silencing him, you know, with their own, yeah. with their bodies. They're giving their life to let the speaker have a voice. Yeah, I, I, that, that's what makes you feel, you know, that, that the third person has, has done something worse than be crap at beekeeping. <laughs> The, the image of him, you can imagine, it's that kind of, that that fantasy of people who do evil things and tell lies, their face sort of doesn't, yeah. doesn't look right. Yeah, it's a, it's a horrific scene. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah, it is. And it, and it kind of happens before you notice it's happened as well. It's, it, he's already left by the time he's described. Yeah. So it's covered in bees. <laughs> okay, so here are the final two stanzas of Stings. They thought death was worth it, but I have a self to recover, a queen. Is she dead? Is she sleeping? Where has she been with her lion-red body, her wings of glass? Now she is flying, more terrible than she ever was. Red scar in the sky, red comet, over the engine that killed her, the mausoleum, the wax house. So they thought death was worth it, but I have a self to recover, a queen. The bees that stung the third person and therefore died thought death was worth it. Those bees, it's worth saying, would have all been female because male bees are stingless. But I have a self to recover, a queen. The speaker does not think that death was worth it. She's not going to um, pursue revenge or chase the third person. As mentioned in the previous section, she is not after revenge, but rebirth and renewal. This symbolic and offhand killing of a male has been talked about by Judith Kroll in relation to the white goddess mythologies that interested both Plath and Hughes. Kroll writes, Plath relinquishing domesticity and the further evaporation of her strangeness finds almost automatic expression through two motifs of the white goddess mythologies, which are now fused in Plath's myth. The killing of the male god, whose death is no longer mourned but celebrated, and the associated rebirth of the goddess. It may also reflect the function and sacrifice of the male bee that a queen takes as her mate. After they have paired, the male dies. As Mary Lynn Bro relates, his abdomen slits open, loosing the entrails, which the queen then totes behind her as a kind of triumphal banner. Dispensable, his death required for propagation of the hive, the mate falls to earth as a carcass. The queen sports her murderous trophy, proof that she has guaranteed the future of the hive. This may contribute to the reddening imagery of the finale. Is she dead? Is she sleeping? Where has she been with her lion red body, her, ring, her wings of glass? The as yet unfound queen is visualized now in more finery than we've seen her before. In Plath's drafts of Sting's, Susan Van Dyne notices that a specifically female identification of the queen, who dreams of a second bride flight, is discarded and replaced with a male association, her lion red body. Through such systematic refigurations, Plath's poetic avatar gains her power, not by marrying the prince, but by appropriating his phallic possibility, writes Van Dyne. Uh, coincidentally, thinking of the Queen's long lion red body as a phallic possibility might have um, contributed somehow to a Freudian slip on the part of Ronald Heyman, who quotes this line in his book as loin red body. I'm not sure which of those was published first, so it might be completely unrelated, but I thought that was quite funny. Beyond the general masculine associations with lions, as opposed to a lioness, uh, Ted Hughes's star sign was Leo, so there may be a more personalised appropriation uh, going on there too, a cosmic appropriation. Now she is flying, more terrible than she ever was, red scar in the sky, red comet. 
So the queen is freed at last, more terrible, meaning more terrifying, more awe-inspiring, but on the B level, embracing her terrible fate. As Jessica Lewis Luck writes, Plath knew that the flight of the queen is a suicidal one. She takes flight when she is old and has been usurped by another queen, and she will die without the protection of the hive. She might be flying with terrible power and beauty, but it is a flight to her death. But again, I, I don't think this speaker is the particular individual queen, but rather she is presiding over the honey machine. She is associating herself with, as Kroll says, the queen ship, not, not this specific queen. Under a different watch, perhaps the watch of this third person, the honey machine has been a killing engine, a mausoleum that has create, created false selves, waxen figures in that wax house. Now that the speaker is in control, it will instead become a functioning, renewed honey machine, a, a process that starts with the terrible but beautiful final flight of the old queen. I think that's why the regal imagery and beauty is undercut by a sense of vulnerability, wings of glass, red scar, not just red comet. This is a queen with old wounds. Over the engine that killed her, the mausoleum, the wax house. Heather Clark, who titled her biography of Plath Red Comet, described a letter from one of Plath's boyfriends, Richard Sassoon. In it, writes Clark, he invokes the symbol of the comet moving through the universe and back again. He advised Plath to fly with it, move with it, rise with it, burn with it, charge with it. It was as if Sassoon had invoked Ariel and Stings nearly a decade before their composition. And at the end, right, there's that really like amazing um, kind of section where you know she she flies right now she is flying more terrible than she ever was red scar in the sky red comet over the engine that killed her the mausoleum the wax house um this is like that liberation scene right where the um the beekeeper who also becomes kind of like a stand-in for creativity she like wants to get herself out of there she doesn't want to die right she wants to be mm. freed she wants to get away from these forces that are conspiring to like contain her and maybe even end her life. So it's kind of like, uh, I think it's a triumphant poem. And that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you so much to my special guest, Patricia Grisafi. You can listen to me and Trish talk more about her book on Plath and her work elsewhere uh, on tomorrow's extended episode that comes out just on the audio platforms, remember? So that's Spotify, iTunes, or wherever else you listen to audio podcasts. I'll be back soon with a with a more Plath podcasts, more videos if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for watching and happy reading.